Hello once again, everybody, and thank you for joining me in the Betters Box. It's bangthebook.com's MLB betting podcast for Thursday, August 27th. I am your host, Adam Burke. As you know, this and every edition of the Betters Box presented by our friends over at DSI Sportsbook. BTB and the number 200 is that promo code. 100% deposit match bonus for the Sportsbook. 100% deposit match bonus for the live casino at BetDSI. It's only a game until you bet it. Daily picks and tips piece on the daily over at bangthebook.com for you to check out. Also covering this weekend's UFC event. We've got NBA playoff stuff, NHL playoff stuff. We've got a NASCAR preview for this weekend, the Coke Zero Sugar 400. Uh, We've got a golf preview, obviously the BMW Championship already going on. But we cover golf every week over at the website as well. Kentucky Derby coming up next week. We'll be talking about that. And we got some NFL content rolling out. Charles J. putting together his list of his three favorite NFL season win total bets going in to this upcoming NFL season, which actually starts two weeks from today, hopefully. Fingers crossed on that one. But we'll be ramping up our NFL coverage over at the website as well. Working on our college football stuff, still trying to figure out what we're going to do here with the daily shows. A lot of moving parts right now over at bangthebook.com. So thanks for sticking with us here throughout the pandemic, and also throughout all this stuff that's going on. One last thing i got to mention here on today's show, if you want to sign up for the Circus Sports Million, the Circus Survivor, the Westgate Super Contest, any of those football contests out in Las Vegas and you do not live in the state of Nevada, you will need a proxy to put in your picks for you. Maddie and Tony over at footballcontest.com do an absolutely outstanding job. They've been our proxy service For the last several years, they've been very accessible, very approachable, uh, very understanding when something comes up. They do an excellent job putting in those picks for you in the Circa, the Super Contest, and everything else going on out there in Las Vegas. So if you're going to join those, and there are some very big overlays this year with the smaller entry fields, check out Maddie and Tony over at footballcontest.com. They've been great for us. We know that they'll be great for you as well. A little bit of a hurried show here today. I got something I got to go take care of. I got a little bit of a late start to the day. But I do have some things I want to pass along for you here on today's edition of the show. And something I wanted to talk about here, something I took a look at this morning, in terms of, you know, obviously betting the money lines here in Major League Baseball, which is the primary way of betting on these games. You know, it's not easy, as we know. I mean, there are a lot of different options out there to you right now things like team totals, things like first fives, all these types of things. But something I started thinking about here and something that maybe I need to adopt more for my handicapping as well, teams this season that have scored four or fewer runs are 121 and 353. Teams that have scored five or more runs are 322 and 90. So one of the things that I always take a look at here when I handicap is that, you know, I'm handicapping both starting pitchers, and maybe I'm going about this all wrong. Maybe instead of trying to figure out which starting pitchers will limit offense, I need to look more at which starting pitchers will allow more offense. Because it's I think it's a lot easier to handicap, and maybe this is something that I should have been doing all along. Maybe it's easier to handicap the guys that won't pitch well as opposed to the guys that will pitch well. Because when you think about you know, the course of making 32 starts or something like that, you know, the best of the best are good because, you know, 20 to 22 of those are really good starts. But they will still have 10 starts in there that either are below average or are just outright terrible. It's, I think, a little bit more difficult to try and pinpoint when guys will have good starts versus when guys won't. And maybe that's a philosophical approach that I need to try to handicap here a little bit more as we go forward. Again, teams that have scored four or fewer runs, 121 and 353. Teams that have scored five or more runs, 322 and 90. So I think you want to look more at teams that are going to score runs versus hoping that teams prevent runs. And, you know, when you whittle this down, I mean, it does make a lot of sense. There's a lot of variance on batted balls. You know, there could be a barrel that winds up being caught by an outfielder or a barrel that winds up going for a three-run double. You know, you don't really know. 
you know, you're trying to handicap as much variance as you can out of the equation, but that's a really difficult thing to do. So I think instead, what we need to take a look at here is looking at more favorable indicators for offense, looking at exit velocities against, looking at barrel rates, looking at hard hit rates. And I guess maybe I should give myself a little bit more credit because that is something that I have done. You know, I have taken a look at, you know, which pitcher allows harder contact, which pitcher allows a higher hard hit rate, because when you think about it, the more hard contact, the more likely that team is to have more offense. So I guess maybe unknowingly, I've even made a little bit of this transition here, but it probably is something I need to take a much stronger look at. Remember, I've cited this tweet several times here already this season from Mike Petrello over at StatCast with MLB Advanced Media, and the tweet that he had on July 29th, teams with higher exit velocities win 60.4% of the time in that game. Teams with more hard-hit balls in that game win 71.5% of the time. Teams with more barrels in that game win 77.4% of the time. So, again, maybe this is a change that I've kind of subconsciously or unknowingly sort of made here with my handicapping, but I think this is a really important thing to talk about here on today's show, not just for the rest of this effed up season, but for future seasons as well. You want to try and find the teams that are more likely to have offensive success. And that sounds obvious, right? It sounds like something that you would definitely want to do day in and day out. But I think generally what we try to do is we try to find the pitchers we think will suppress offense better. And maybe we need to look at it the other way around in terms of looking at the offense that has a better chance. Remember, starting pitchers are such a big element of the equation here, even though they're throwing fewer innings than ever before, (coughs) excuse me, you know, we still handicap a lot on those starting pitchers, but maybe you've got to take a look more at those offenses, how they match up. And that is something I guess I've tried to do in past seasons as well, in terms of looking at things like platoon advantages. This year, platoon advantages have not been as fruitful. Teams have not had as much success with those for a variety of different reasons, playing time, reps, uh, defensive shifts, things of that sort. But, you know, again, I think that we need to look at the teams expected to score more runs. The teams, and, and maybe this filters into something else, a different way of betting on baseball, the team total aspect of it. You know, if, if it's all about run scoring nowadays, and realistically with home runs and launch angles and stuff like that, it probably is, maybe team totals are the better approach. Yes, there are lower limits to betting on team totals, and you can get limited on those you know, low market props if you're doing really well. The sports books will catch on to that, potentially may flag your account, stuff like that. But if you're a smaller better, and, and I presume most of the listeners of the show are, maybe team totals are the way you want to look. Maybe that's an easier handicap because really you're handicapping one side of the game instead of both sides of the game. You know, if you're handicapping a full game, You're looking at both starting pitchers, both bullpens, both offenses. But with team totals, you start looking only at one side of the game, that offense versus that pitcher and those relievers. And maybe that's the way that we should approach this. Because again, you know, as the markets get sharper, as technology gets better, as you have a new crop of odds maker and bookmaker, You know, we talk about things like Hall of Fame voting for Major League Baseball and how, you know, the steroid era guys have been chastised a lot by this current crop of voters. And somebody, you know, one of the members of Indians Twitter kind of said something about Nelson Cruz, you know, and how he has a Hall of Fame, uh, you know, how he has Hall of Fame potential, maybe some candidacy coming up here when he retires. And Cruz is a guy that is shrouded by that PED suspension that he got. But when you start thinking about the voting electorate for the Hall of Fame, it's my generation that's going to start getting more votes, more say, things like that. Those are guys that could shift the dynamics of Hall of Fame voting. So I kind of draw a parallel with the odds making and the book making process. You you think about a sports book like Circa out in Las Vegas, for example, that is a young staff. Those are a lot of younger guys that are in positions to make, you know, five and six figure decisions with what they do, balancing risk with what they do, you know, innovating out there in the market, stuff like that. 
It's kind of the new wave of odds maker, risk manager, bookmaker, all of that. And that's kind of what we're getting now. Some of the old guard that maybe doesn't believe as much in some of the advanced metrics or maybe doesn't believe in technology as much, some of those people are kind of being phased out a little bit now, replaced by a younger generation. You know, a lot of people that have been Twitter handicappers and stuff like that have posted or been part of information sharing groups. Those are people now getting trader jobs out there in the industry. So we also need to adapt. And maybe adapting means betting some of these team total props instead of full games where the lines should be a little bit sharper. Betting things like the strikeout props and stuff like that. It's all about adapting and evolving. And right now, more than ever, we have these opportunities to bet these alternate lines, these props, stuff like that. You know, I read a great article uh, yesterday from at plus EV analytics on Twitter talking about season win totals and looking at how to analyze the season win total market and why alternate win totals may be a better option. There could be a lot more plus EV betting options out there for alternate win totals. You know, you think back 10, 15 years ago, we maybe had basic win total numbers, not even all the teams for college football, stuff like that. But now you've got alternate win total lines out there. It's up to us. It's up to us to evolve and adapt and try to find these different options to go and exploit because the sports books are primarily putting these things up to generate action. But if we can generate that action with some plus EV moves, that's the future wave of this business between that and live betting. So maybe team totals, something we should look at a little bit more. And, you know, take this for example. You know, yesterday... We were on the Cubs and Tigers first five over six, never came close. The full game goes over 10 and a half. And that's one of the things that I've kind of agonized with here a little bit this season, playing the first five or the full game. Because effectively you're handicapping that game twice. You know, do I like it for the first five? Do I like it for the full game when the bullpens get involved and stuff like that? And I knew the Cubs and Tigers both had bad bullpens. But the Tigers were facing a lefty in John Lester. The Tigers hit lefties very well. So I thought, okay, for however long Lester's out there, they've got this platoon advantage. But then they score off the Cubs bullpen. And so that's one of the challenging things here. But you look at the Tigers against John Lester and you say, okay, they match up really well against lefties. I'm going to play their team total over. And you give yourself this safety net if the bad Cubs bullpen struggles. So maybe that was a mistake on my end yesterday. And maybe that's been a mistake of mine over the last couple of years. You know, instead of handicapping the game twice, do I play first five? Do I play full game? Instead of handicapping both teams for, you know, a joint total like that, maybe you look more at the team total side of the spectrum. And I think that will be a change that I will try to make. Maybe not this year, just because everything's already kind of wonky with the, you know, weird start to the season and, everything else, all the double headers and stuff like that. But maybe that's a change I will make, a concerted effort I will make going forward to evolve as a handicapper, to maybe take some of the variants in a very high variance environment out of the equation a little bit. And you talk about live betting here, and I just wanted to run this data real quick on today's show. Teams with a lead after five innings have won 82.8% of the time. That's mostly in line with what we generally see. Last year, it was 84%, so it was a little bit higher last season. Bullpens were a little bit more effective. This year, bullpens have very high walk rates, stuff like that. But from a live betting standpoint, you've got to remember that teams are only going to win when trailing going into the sixth about 17% of the time on average. So I don't know necessarily if baseball is the greatest of live betting sports. I think the other sports like football and basketball Maybe a little bit better for this. Uh, just with baseball, you know, you kind of get, uh, you know, some uncertainty in terms of which relievers will be used, stuff like that. But again, you're talking about about a 17% win percentage for a team trailing after five innings. So I think live betting is a little bit of a challenge here, unless you can really isolate those bullpens that are absolutely terrible. You know, again, I, I think that that's why, and I talk about live betting being the wave of the future in a lot of sports markets. I don't think it's for this one. I think it's team total betting. I think it's the props. I think it's some of the different stuff that you can play out there, maybe alternate run lines, stuff like that. 
I think that's a better approach here with Major League Baseball. I know I'm kind of jumping all over the page here a little bit. Like I said, I got something I got to get to. So trying to kind of speed things up a little bit here. But again, just looking at, I think you should always take some time to reevaluate your philosophy. And I think to me, maybe I'm making things a little bit too difficult on myself, not just with the very elaborate write-ups on a daily basis, but because maybe there are some better markets that we can attack out there to where we don't have to handicap as much variance out, don't have to fully handicap both teams and hope for the best. Maybe the team total markets are something that we really do need to look to attack a lot more here as we go forward. All right, so for the down the line segment today, something I wanted to mention real quickly, watch for first five moves that maybe don't correlate to what you're seeing with the full game. You know, on Monday, we had a first five play on the Marlins and Pablo Lopez. They were minus 117. That's where we got it in the article for the first five. They were still a full game underdog. Now, this is a very rare sight to see. Uh, They did wind up covering the first five. They actually won the first five pretty handily, won the game as well. But keep an eye out for this, where first fives maybe don't have the same correlation to the line move you're seeing for the full game. This could be something that we see a lot more often because, again, a lot of people handicapping starting pitchers, a lot of sharper money hitting the first five markets, trying to take the bullpens out of the equation. I don't know how often we see this, but it was something that I picked up on Monday, and it is something that you want to try to follow along with as well because, again, as I just mentioned, teams with a lead after five are winning 82.8% of the time. And that's been about the average 83 or so percent over the last several years. If they're going to win the game 83% of the time when they win the first five, shouldn't there be a correlated move when the first five is moving with, you know, the the full game movement as well? So maybe there we could get a little bit of betting value by honing in on that a little bit more as well. Also on Monday, we saw Casey Mize take some money for the Tigers against Alec Mills and the Cubs. Cubs did win that game. Mize struggled a little bit, flashed some brilliance, but did struggle. But Alec Mills, being an ERA FIP guy, still seeing movements on guys like that out there in the marketplace. They're not quite as prevalent or as large in size as they have been in the past, but we are still seeing those ERA and FIP movements out there in the marketplace. Also on Monday, we saw Kenta Maeda money on the Twins against Aaron Savale and the Indians. Probably not a whole lot of money, a whole lot of value, excuse me, on Kenta Maeda moving forward. Another good start for him there on Monday. Tuesday, we saw an Eric Fetty fade and a fade of the Nationals against Jake Arietta and the Phillies. I always take extra notice of line moves like this because Fetty and Arietta are both bad pitchers in my estimation. So I want to see which one the market hates more. And in this case, the market hated Eric Fetty more. Big ERA fifth discrepancy. I think it was about three runs uh, at the time. But if money comes in on a game like that, it does tell you what they think about the worst pitcher between the two guys. And that's something you can carry over as you go forward as well. If they prefer a guy like Jake Arrieta to Eric Fetty, well, Jake Arrieta is, you know, a well below average pitcher. So what does that tell you about future Eric Fetty outings? It tells you that the market does not like him at all. So maybe you get out in front of a line move or it's a game you can kind of bypass if you don't like where that line is sitting. We saw Tyler Glassnow money come in for the Rays on Tuesday. We also saw Lucas Giolito money come in on the White Sox against the Pirates for Tuesday. This is starting to be a pretty common trend here. We've seen Shane Bieber money. We saw Chris Paddock money come in against the Mariners. These pitchers that the market really likes, and and Paddock is probably the exception because he's not been very good lately. But the money, the the big favorite roles on the market pitchers that, you know, are in big favorite situations. Well, that made no sense whatsoever. We'll try that again. The money that comes in on these big favorite pitchers that the market likes has come in fast and heavy here of late. Guys like Glass now, guys like Blake Snell, Giolito, Shane Bieber, Uh, stuff like that, these guys are getting pumped into bigger favorite roles. And that's not a surprising thing. It's been happening a lot here over the last several years. But it does speak to the fact that I think that the markets have found that we've reached some level of normalcy here, where the ace-level starting pitchers are being their dominant selves, 
and the bad teams or the inferior teams are getting to that point as well. So again, when you get these big favorite roles, you're going to see money come in on those guys here, I think more often than not, as we move forward. And that's just a usual trend. You know, April, March and April, you get that underdog money, May through the end of the year, you get that favorite money, especially on those big favorites. That appears to be the case out there in the marketplace right now. I think the most interesting game on Tuesday, the most interesting game of the week, was the Rockies and the Diamondbacks. Now, this was Herman Marquez on the road. Now, the roof was open at Chase Field, where Chase Field plays a lot different with the roof open as opposed to the roof closed. But Herman Marquez has been exceptional on the road over the last several years. I mean, that's just his MO. He's bad at home, like most pitchers are at Coors Field, and he's very good on the road. And the Rockies were taking on Alex Young in this start here. And Alex Young is kind of a soft tosser, kitchen sink arsenal left-hander, you know, contact management type of guy, stuff like that. We generally see money hit the board on Marquez on the road. And we didn't get that in this game. And in fact, this was a flipped favorite scenario where the Rockies went from a favorite to a dog. Now they did win the game five to four, but this was a very telltale sign of what the market thinks about the Colorado Rockies right now. The Rockies have the worst road offense in baseball, and they've been terrible against left-handers. Alex Young is not a great left-handed pitcher. The Diamondbacks are not a great team. In fact, they've been struggling a lot here over the last week, week and a half. And yet, the market came in on Arizona, on Young against Marquez. And yeah, the Rockies won. But this is a process over results type of analysis here where this told me a lot about what the market thinks about the Colorado Rockies. And so I'm going to try to carry that with me. And, you know, it won't impact my handicapping of every game. But when you've got the wisdom of crowds, specifically with sharp money that influences the market, and they're against the Rockies in a scenario like that, man, that says a lot to me. That really stood out. It was a fascinating market move. Also, some money came in on the over in that game. But it was a fascinating market move, to say the least. And it makes me think that you know maybe the market selling some of that Herman Marquez stock for this 2020 season. On Wednesday, look, you know, again, we talk about line moves that we're surprised to see. Dakota Hudson getting faded. Mike Fires getting faded. That's not surprising at all. That's like clockwork. That's always going to happen. And that was the case on Wednesday. Both of them did win. Uh, but money did come in against both of them in the marketplace. Thursday, look, four double headers throwing a wrench in the card, late line postings, trying to find out who the hell is actually starting these games. Tough day to handicap, to be sure. Got some picks over in my daily picks and tips piece over at bangthebook.com. All totals for today, a couple of double header totals. Don't like any sides. You can check those out over at the website. All right, so let's take a look here at the weekend ahead. Four series under the microscope for me. A's and Astros has got to be the first one. Frankie Montas, Lance McCullers Jr. on Friday. Jesus Lazardo, Zach Granke Saturday. Sean Manaya, Franber Valdez on Sunday. The A's have a good chance here to kind of widen their lead a little bit in the AL West. The Astros, I give them credit. They come into the day at 17 and 14, but in spite of everything that's happened, you know, they've played pretty well overall. Looks like they're going to make the playoffs probably as one of the wild cards. I want to see what these prices look like. We've talked about this a lot. We've seen this out there in the betting markets. The A's have been overvalued. Their prices have been high. And in fairness, they've won a lot of games. They've played very well. Their prices have been a little bit inflated, though. Will they be inflated here against the Astros with McCullers, Granke, and Valdez? Currently, they're three best starting pitchers. I want to see what these lines look like. And also, too, the A's have played a lot of schlubs. They've played a lot of bad teams this year. They've played five games, five games against teams 500 or better. They have played a berry patch of a schedule to this point. And they get an Astros team here that is missing Alex Bregman, but the offense is a little bit healthier with Michael Brantley back now. Um, You know, they've got... McCullers, Greinke, and Valdez, they've got some guys that can play. You know, they've got a very strong organizational system there, a lot of depth. The bullpen's been kind of patchwork, but they've figured it out. 
I kind of like the Astros a little bit here in this series, and we'll see how it plays out. I definitely like them on Sunday with Valdez against Manaya. Valdez has been very, very good here so far. But again, I want to see what these prices look like. How much respect does Oakland get when they're stepping up in class a little bit here to take on a team that is a little bit closer to their talent level? Giants and Diamondbacks. Tyler Anderson, Luke Weaver on Friday. Luke Weaver's pitched much better here of late. Trevor Cahill to be determined on Saturday. The Diamondbacks without Merrill Kelly now. Sunday, Johnny Cueto and Alex Young. This is a big series. You know, these two teams are in the thick of the playoff race. The Diamondbacks obviously falling out of it here a little bit with how they've played lately. But nobody's jumping up to take those last couple of playoff berths in the National League. The Giants have played very, very well of late. The Diamondbacks have not. I feel like I believe in the Diamondbacks and their personnel a little bit more. So this is a big series for them. Again, even though they're not playing well, they're not that far out of the playoff hunt because nobody really is except for the absolute bottom feeders. So this is a big series here at Chase Field. As always, check and see if the roof will be open because that ballpark plays a lot different when the roof is open as opposed to when it's closed. Speaking of the NL West, Padres and Rockies. Now these two teams, a lot more in the thick of the playoff race. Zach Davies, Antonio Senzatella, Adrian Morjan and Ryan Castellani, Chris Paddock and Herman Marquez. You know, This is a really intriguing series to me because Davies is a contact management guy. I don't know if the market will love him at Coors Field. Sensatella gives up a ton of hard contact. Lean Padres in that one. Morjon, I mean, who knows what we get out of him going to Coors Field for the first time. Castellani's given up a lot of hard contact, but he's gotten away with it. Paddock has not pitched well. I just stepped up on my soapbox and talked about the market and Herman Marquez. Interesting series here in a lot of different ways. A lot of different ways. I don't know what I'll play in this series, if anything, but I want to see the line moves. I want to see where these numbers get posted because I think there are a lot of questions about this series. The Padres' offense has been exceptional anywhere they've played. The Rockies have been awful on the road and pretty good at home, which is their usual MO. Interesting series, to say the least. I don't know if I'll have a lot of betting interest, but it is one that's on my radar. And finally here, Indians and Cardinals. The Cardinals, after today's doubleheader against the Pirates, will have played 17 games in 13 days. Now they welcome the Indians, Tristan McKenzie and Daniel Ponce de Leon on Friday, Carlos Carrasco, Jack Flaherty Saturday, Aaron Savale, Adam Wainwright on Sunday. The Indians still can't hit, but as we know, they're pitching very, very well. Saturday, I'll be on the Cardinals, though. That's Carlos Carrasco and Jack Flaherty. Probably Cardinals first five, because I don't love the Cardinals' bullpen. But Carlos Carrasco is not sustaining his velocity throughout his starts. He's had some long first and second innings here of late. Something is not right with Carlos Carrasco. He's had control issues. He's had command issues. I'll be on the Cardinals Saturday at least for the first five with Carrasco and Flaherty. But other than that, again, the Cardinals playing a lot of games in a short period of time here, trying to catch up with all those COVID postponements. Uh, But again, the big takeaway for me out of this series is will be Flaherty on Saturday, and maybe Savale on Sunday over Wainwright. Wainwright doesn't really throw a lot of change-ups. The Indians can hit fastballs. Curveballs are kind of iffy on, but Wainwright doesn't have the change-up. I think the Indians could have success on Sunday, and I do like Savale really snapping back into form in his last start. I'll probably be back on Monday with another edition of the Betters Box. I do have things going on on Monday as well. I'll let you know if that will happen. Uh, But, you know, very busy times here right now over at bangthebook.com. So keep it locked in on the website, as always. That'll do it for me. Thank you so much for listening, everybody. And remember that you will never strike out when you're in the betters box.